This is out of the registration. Hello everyone. Um, so last week, I finally received my confirmation letter that I had passed part three of the architecture practice exam process and I'm officially eligible to become a registered architect in New South Wales. Woo! So it's been over a year since I've started my registration process and honestly it's probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Um, there's very little information out there about what is actually involved and what the process is and how do you actually approach this. So if you're thinking about registering as an architect in Australia, namely New South Wales, um, I'd like to share 10 of my best tips to help you through this process. Tip number one, start early. I started studying one year before I knew I was going to take the part two exam. Um, and that gave me enough time to uh, do my logbook, get the, um, fill up the holes in my experience that I knew I had, um, and also start studying all of the material, and there is a lot, um, a lot of material that you need to be able to take the exam. Um, I probably wouldn't take the next exam session, I'd probably take the one after that, just to give you enough time to study and plan for everything. Um, so for example, the next, it's now May, the next session is um, in August. So if you're planning to start your registration process now and you've decided to take, and you haven't studied it at all and you're um, planning to take the exam in August, I would probably skip that and take the one next year in, um, in April. Just to give you enough time to make sure that you know everything, otherwise you'll probably end up having to take the exam twice and that's not a good experience. Tip number two, if you're working, speak to your boss or your manager or a senior architect um, and, or HR and tell them that you're planning to start your registration process. Um, most firms that I know are very supportive of their staff getting registered, so they'll probably you know, be able to plan around your study schedule, give you some study leave, um, let you leave work a bit earlier or just change your working arrangements to make it easier for you to attend class and to study um, and prepare yourself for registration. Um, if you have seniors or your boss is a very um, knowledgeable architect, and he probably is, um, ask him for help. Ask him to give you some tips on how to study, um, clarify some of the questions you might have, talk about topics like you know, contract administration is something that is very difficult for people to wrap their heads around if they've never actually administered a, um, a contract. So ask them to um, explain some of the concepts to you or even um, let you help out on one, a project that they are currently administering the contract for and just explain their own process um, and how they work through everything. That's going to be very helpful to you. Tip number three. Decide how you want to get registered. So typically um, the process is you take, you do the logbook, you take the exam and you get to your interview and then you can become registered. But if you are um, an overseas registered architect or you've been educated overseas, um, there's a different pathway you can take um, and you might have to get your portfolio and your, um, your education recognized by the board before you can take the exam. Or if you're a really experienced architect, you might have like seven to ten years of experience under, under your belt. You can take a different pathway where you don't have to do the exam. You just, yeah. Um, and that could be an option for you. So depending on what your circumstances are, do your research and decide how exactly you want to um, attempt the registration process and which pathway you're going to choose. Tip number four, um, start your logbook early. So like I said, um, I started my logbook a year before I wanted to take the exam, or I knew I, want, I was going to take the exam, and I filled out everything, all the experiences that I had um, accumulated at that point, and just checked against the competencies and um, that I need to achieve. So when I say competencies, it's the areas of knowledge that you must have, and those are tagged against hours um, of experience in your logbook, for you to be eligible to take um, to attempt the practical exam. So a lot of the times when you're an, a young architect and you're working, you have a lot of documentation hours, um, but you might not have a lot of client-facing hours, a lot of um, briefing hours, or you might not have a lot of um, contract administration hours. Um, 
that you need to speak to your boss or your employer about, let them know that here are the um, competencies you're still missing. And in the 12 months um, that you have before you have to lodge your logbook, you have to try and get as much of that, those hours covered as possible. And your boss needs to plan ahead in their work to allow you to do that. When you first decide you want to register as an architect, hop onto the AACA website, um, link below, and download a copy of the logbook. It's free, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and just fill out everything that you can. Um, all the projects that you have done to date, and hopefully you would have had a couple of years of worked experience under your belt before you decide to attempt the process. Um, and see where you're still missing in hours, and make a plan and put a strategy together um, for how you're going to complete the logbook. Tip number five, uh, decide if you want to attend a study course to help you um, gain the knowledge you need to pass a practical exam. A lot of people think that because they've worked a long time as an architect that they would know everything they need to pass the practical exam. Um, however, that's not true. Um, the practical exam covers a large amount of information and a lot of the information is kind of book learning. You won't know about it unless you're studying law or you're studying contract law, um, mostly law, um, or you have been specifically told about certain um, codes of conduct that you may not encounter every day um, when you're working in an architecture firm. So it's definitely worth your while to attend one of the study sessions so you can get so you can have somebody to explain all of these complicated um, topics to you that will be tested in the practical exam and in the interview. Um, there's two options. One is PALS, which is run by the Australian Institute of Architect, um, and they run it in each state by their state chapter. Um, I did mine in New South Wales. Um, and it was a great way to get an overall an overview of all the different topics um, that the practical exam might cover and their focus is to train you up as a good architect um, but their focus may not necessarily be to help you pass the exam. They just want to help you become a well-rounded architect, know all the topics that you should know as a registered architect um, and then hopefully you would be ready to then take the practical exam. Um, option number two is called Parks, Park. PARC. It's run by an independent um, institution and started in Melbourne, but now it is known, um, but they have started running classes in Sydney now. And their focus is more on helping you pass the um, practical exam component because that is the one that everyone seems to struggle with. It does give you an overview of all of the things that PALS would cover. From what I have heard, there is an instructor and a class and it's a lot more conversational and you can ask more questions and have a bit more um, um, of a back and forth with the instructor while in PALS, it's more of a lecture and then tutorial format. So it, you have a two hour lecture where somebody stands up on a podium, does their presentation, and then you have a one hour tutorial where you get to ask questions. So if you really need a bit more of a hands-on like hand-holding approach, I would recommend um, Park over PALS. Um, but like I said, I only attended PALS, so maybe I'll find somebody who did PALS and they can tell you which one is better. Tip number six, find a study buddy or find a study group to help you go through this journey together. It's not only just so you have companionship. A lot of the times, um, the concepts are so complicated and they're so different so there's so many different ways you can interpret the information that having somebody to talk to um, and work through the questions and talk about the different um, aspects and how different people would approach things, um, it's very beneficial. And also if you have a large enough group and they work at different firms, you can see how different firms actually um, operate and how they, tie, um, how they address all of these different issues that are brought up such as contracts and law and liability and all of that. Um, but I think the most important aspect of having a study buddy or having a study group is to keep you motivated. Keep you motivated. It is a very long and boring <laughs> process to study for um, the practice exam and sometimes you're going to fall off the bandwagon, sometimes you're going to play the it's too hard card, sometimes you're going to want to go on a holiday or chill out. 
No, you need somebody to grab you by the hand and say, no, you need to study, come out and study with me, or um, let's have a regular study session and you can't back out of it if you have promised somebody. And it's the same for them as well. Like they're going to have their moments of weakness. They're going to like start stressing out. They're going to say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And it's your job to keep your study buddy, your friend on track so you can both pass together. Um, I'm very grateful to have my study buddy um, and we pass the exam together. Um, I roped her in um, when I roped her in halfway through my process and she had six months to study. Um, for the exam and she passed so that's an amazing achievement but honestly I couldn't have done it without her either so thank you study buddy tip number seven seven this is seven um, find a mentor or a senior to guide you through the process so I mentioned earlier you should speak to your boss um, your boss may not necessarily be a good mentor because he probably is busy running the firm and if he's not then there's a problem. You can look for somebody who has recently um, registered or um, somebody who has registered one or two years ago so it's still fresh in their mind and better yet if you have a really senior architect who is in touch with the Institute they have probably been an interviewer and that would be an even better solution. You grab them and say please help me please please please. Um, I had a mentor at work for a couple of months before she left, but in that couple of months, it was actually very beneficial for her, uh, for us um, to speak to her whenever we had questions, um, when we had, uh, when we needed clarifications or help answer one of the practice questions because she went through the process, I think two years before us, and she knew exactly what um, the test was actually trying to test you on and what the answers they were expecting are um, and also how the interviewers are going to ask these questions and how you should respond. So having somebody who's actually going through the process is very important. Tip number eight, um, consider changing jobs um, to a smaller firm. Um, if you are in a larger firm, you may have noticed that it's very difficult for you to break out of the documentation or CAD monkey pigeonhole that people like stuffing you in. Um, I had that issue. I worked for um, two large firms before I began my registration process and people who have, like friends of mine who graduated at the same time as me and worked for the same number of um, years at smaller firms seemed to have a lot more practical experience and were way um, further ahead in the um, kind of architect development process than I was. So I made the decision when I decided I want to register as an architect to move to a smaller firm and um, gain more experience on smaller projects where I'd be given a lot more um, autonomy and leadership opportunities and I was able to do that and when I interviewed for my job I did make it clear to them that I wanted to register as an architect and I needed a lot um, I needed to be given leadership opportunities in you know the areas I'm still missing in my logbook because I had done my logbook already, um, and they were happy to to um, craft my role to fit what I needed. They said you can lead DAs, you can lead smaller projects. Very happy for you to do that, um, and taking that initiative will actually make you seem like a better candidate than somebody who just comes in saying, "Oh, I kind of just want a job." Go in and say. Here's my career path. I'm looking to become a registered architect, and when I'm a registered architect, you're going to be, um, I'm going to be a much better asset to you um, as an employee. Tip number nine, nine, yeah. Tip number nine, um, set up a regular study routine. So for me, I did one day a week um, on the weekend on Saturday, where I would spend, um, you know, maybe four hours or five hours um, just studying reading through the material. If you attended PALS, there is a 17 module system um, and over seven weeks. So each week you're expected to read all of the material um, for two, at least two of the modules. And that can be up to a hundred pages long. Like it takes a significant amount of time to go through all of that information and for you to then revise it again and again and again until it sticks in your head. You're going to need to spread that out over a long time. So if you are lucky enough to have a year in advance, definitely you know, do one day a week and just um, systematically get through the material. Um, or if you do decide to do PALS, I would definitely do it 
um, in the first six months um, rather than the last six months right before your exam so that um, during PALS you'll go through all the material and then you will then um, have six months to revise all the material not that you'll actually use it because I procrastinate a lot. Do PALS, read all the material, then set up a study schedule one day a week, two days a week um, to re revise and read through everything again so that by the time you hit your practical exam you are set you have everything stuck in your head and you're ready to tackle anything that they throw at you and finally tip number 10 enjoy the process I really enjoyed the registration process I loved learning um, all of the different topics and different materials um, and being exposed to all that new information you get to see all of the different aspects, um, all of the different responsibilities that an architect has, um, what that means for your career, and you get a better understanding of how an architecture office operates, um, why things are set up this way, why we have to speak to clients a certain way, why we have to um, do documentation a certain way, um, what are the things you should be looking out for when you are working at, um, as, as, as an architect even before you're registered? So after you find out about this information, you know, take the time and actually appreciate um, the work that you're doing in the office and try and apply the concepts that you learn um, to your work and it will definitely help you. I know at the beginning of the video I said it was a very long and tiring um, and hard process and it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done but I honestly do not regret one second of it. Um, I really do think this is beneficial for everyone. Um, even if you're not thinking of registering, registering as an architect, there might not be a reason for you to have to register and pay the registration fee every year. But if you are working in the building and construction industry, um, if you are a building designer or if you're a graduate or if you're a draftsman, it is definitely worth your while to learn about the material that's tested in the registration process because it is applicable to um, everyone. It's applicable to everyone who works on a building project. And as you probably know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong um, when you design and build a building. So. Having that in your pocket, knowing how to protect yourself um, in case things go wrong, um, is always going to be worth the, um, <clears throat> is always going to be worth your while. So that's it. That's my ten tips. Um, thank you for your time. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and you find it useful. I'm going to leave a couple of um, helpful links to some of the things that I talked about, like where to um, download your logbook and different information about the pathways to registration. Um, and also any other useful information that I can find um, in the comments below. Um, stay tuned, I'm going to be releasing a couple more videos about um, preparing for the registration process and then um, following that I'll release a video a week on the different topics that can be tested on the practical exam. Uh, my intention is to help as many people as possible going through the registration process and it's also a very expensive process. You don't, you might not have the money to actually pay for um, one of those study courses. So, um, if you want an alternative, subscribe and watch my videos. So today, I'd like to share ten tips. Let's try this again. Tip number eight. Oops. Tip number eight. No. Eight. 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 I made the decision when I decided to register as an architect um, that I had to change back to an older... Uh, 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 no idea what I'm doing. I'm recording, but I don't know what to say. How to get started on YouTube. Number one, product placement. Sponsored by Coca-Cola. Mmm, <laughs> refreshing. <laughs>